Welcome back. You're still watching Channel Television's special program on Democracy Day, giving hope to Nigeria. Remember that you can join us uh, online. Follow the uh, conversation on social media at our handles at Channel CV on Twitter, at Channel Television on Instagram, and it's streaming live on our YouTube channel. And you can also watch us if you're in the United Kingdom, Sky 518. And yes, we also have and have had uh, for the past an hour or so uh, members of uh, the audience here uh, in our Lagos studio. Um, um, and they will be, of course, asking uh, some questions, of course, during the end. And we'd like to, you know, inform you um, that, you know, you can put down your questions. Some of you would like to, of course, ask them, um, you know, by audio. Uh, we would also be taking them. And this is towards the end. And you can indeed join that conversation online um, as well. Absolutely. So uh, in, this, in, this, in this segment now, we're going to go slightly deeper and that's why we've uh, uh, retained uh, Dr. Uh, Kabira Damo, Managing Director of Beacon Securities, who's here in Lagos. Uh, Major General Henry Ayola, uh, former Chief of uh, the Defense Research and Development in our Abuja studios. And we expect that uh, we're, we're, we're being joined, of course, uh, by uh, Ms. Indy Kato. Uh, and, uh, um, we're also expecting uh, to be joined by Professor uh, uh, Abed uh, Balogu. Yeah, there's uh, Indicato. Yes, there's ED, Indicato. Dinari Hi, Foundation. Indy. Welcome to the program. Indy's in our Abuja studios as well. Me. All right. Thank, thank you for your time. Welcome. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Ahmed Balogu is uh, in uh, uh, the Federal University of uh, Technology at Korea, and he joins uh, uh, we expect him to be joining us uh, uh, virtually. Uh, he is a food expert. He is a food security expert, and that is one of the things that we will also be focusing on and how that has been affected uh, by uh, insecurity. In fact, about 19.4 million people will face food security across, uh, insecurity rather, across Nigeria between June and August this year. A report by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization processed in collaboration with Nigeria's Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development and other stakeholders analyzed acute food and nutritional insecurity in the Sahel and West African region. The report said the food crisis will affect Nigerians in 21 states and the FCT, including 416,000 internally displaced persons. As at May 2022, it noted that about 14.4 million people, including 385,000 IDPs in 21 states and the FCT, are already in the food crisis. The analysis for the month of March covered several states, uh, Abia, Damawa, Edo, Gombe, uh, Katsina, Lagos, uh, Sokoto, Taraba, uh, Yubi, and Zamfara. And of course, uh, we mentioned uh, the FCT. Well, um, I mean, let's just really delve into this. Uh, essentially, what we're witnessing in terms of, you know, uh, security and how it's affecting other parts uh, of the sector, the economy, agriculture. Indy, I'd like you to come in here since you've just joined us uh, from Abuja Studios. Um, essentially, your thoughts. We are celebrating Democracy Day today, but we're really focusing on insecurity. Is there much hope for Nigerians when they think of the aspect uh, our security? So, as, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking as a Nigerian who is clearly affected by this. I, um, I hate to be the one to break the, the, the news or to be the, you know, having of bad news, but no, there isn't right now. We do want to hope for better, but every day, it's like you come on, you come on any platform at all, and what you're met with is a barrage of bad news, of different things happening to people in this nation, and you're just wondering when is your turn. You know, I, I saw conversations about the Owo massacre, and on the same day, things happened in Southern Kaduna, where I come from, and these things are happening almost every day. One news after the other it has become so much that we can't even keep track anymore and it's it's i mean it, it is disheartening but at the same time we need to move beyond okay we're mourning yes we are but every day every day we've come to the point where 
it's just it has become our normal yes it has become our normal but something needs to happen we can't continue like this i can't even at this point project it to oh a new person in power is going to change this it has become our normal this is what the nigerian the average nigerian wakes up to this segment is about food security this segment really tells us look in a matter of time nigerians will be starving we're starving already i come from a very very wealthy place when it comes to food but if you go to the village people barely have food to eat if if there's one thing we always have in store, it will be grains. If there's one thing we always eat, tubers of anything to make sure that food is there, it's not there anymore. The result of insecurity is glaring at us in the face. We can't continue to act like, you know what, this is, this is not happening or this is happening just in small bits and pieces. This is our normal and it has consumed the whole nation. Stay with you, India, and ask and ask, uh, as you said, uh, Southern Kaduna, like many other parts of the North and indeed many other parts of the country, uh, are areas that are supposed to produce food in uh, significant quantities, not just for the immediate environment, but for movement to other areas where they produce other things and then collect those other things and bring uh, uh, there. But this insecurity uh, that you've talked about prevents farmers from getting to their farms. Uh, and if they can't get to their farms, they can't plant, they can't have vests. Um, so there isn't anything to eat. So that's what you've talked about now. But I want to go beyond that and find out what really, uh, if we take the Southern Kaduna example, beyond, beyond the headlines of so, so so number of people attacked, so so number of villages and so on, what really is the problem in that area? What have you identified or have you zeroed in to be the cause of this insecurity uh, and what we can do about it? So it's prevalent attacks against the farmers in this area, against indigents of places, um, uh, of these places. And at the end of the day, I think one of the first things we had to deal with was insincerity on the part of those whose job it is to tackle this. You know, we have gone through this battle back and forth with the government on what was supposed to be done. And we had talks of, the first time we had talks of ex exchanging money with, with, with these killers. You know, the government, um, our, our governor spoke about something, uh, I think on the station he did that. And... Uh, we, we have, we've really gone down the rabbit hole since then. They have collected more and more. This is running into billions. Um, it is suicidal. That's the best way to point, um, paint it. To go to the farm in some of these places right now is absolutely suicidal. These attacks keep happening. It can be loan attacks. We hear, you, you, you may hear of the one that 50-something people, 30-something people um, died, like the recent one, you know, where they said, oh, the helicopter was there, but then it was, it was said the helicopter came to help. But there are every day, if a person goes to the farm, one person goes to the farm, the person is dead. Two people go to the farm, they are dead. Three people go, they are dead. It's happening over and over again. And then in these poor communities, incident kidnappings are happening. These people still have to take from what they do not have and give to these, to, to, to these attackers. And then this further emboldens the attackers. We're seeing different narratives happening. And in certain places, in the same Kaduna, we'd want to be told that, oh, in certain places it's clashes, but in other places it's, at, it's attacks by, 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 by terrorists. In other places, it's ice work. We don't even know, you know, what the, 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 the narrative, the general narrative is. It's almost, it's the same space. How are we saying, oh, this here, this is this here, that is that there. It's the same space. It's the same modus operandi we are seeing. The same kidnappings happening. The same attacks on communities happening. The same thing. So right now, we're just looking at, for me, for me, I'm, I'm looking at, look, People from these areas, I as a Southern Kaduna person, speaking for people from all of these places, need, number one, a certain level of truth from the government. Number two, a commitment to ending these things. There's one thing to come on the media and say, I'm committed to ending this. And then it's another thing for people to see sincerity of purpose, because a lot of the time people in these communities talk about calling out for help, and then there is nothing, nothing being done. Even the governor at some point, when the, the train attack happened, opened his mouth and said, look, sometimes they point to where, where these attackers are and nothing has been done. All of these things reduces faith. People need to hope for something. People need to feel like, look, we're being heard, somebody cares. And all of these things reduces that. And it's not, it's not in one place you're hearing it. Severally, over the years, even when I was in university in Unijos, people would say, look, we called for help. Security personnel were right there. Oh, while well, they kidnapped us, we were passing. There were soldiers there. This one and that one. Like, these narratives are always there. And then people talk of seeing, oh, what they say are, oh, sometimes people say, look, oh, it seems that there are soldiers here aiding and abetting. Sometimes you see news of people who have abandoned their post to join. It's, none of this helps at this point. 
people need a sense of hope. People also need to be included in the security of their place. We've talked about state and community policing for so long now, but even for some of our areas, if we're not even going to get that, can we at least get the dignity of civilians joint tax force? Many of the, in the Northeast, they have that, but we don't know why in Kaduna, for example, we're not getting that. People want to be able to protect their homes. They, want to, they can point, they can show you. Some of them have learned to even fight. Allow people. I think we need to get people from this grassroots. We need to ensure that look, the people who are most affected by this are involved in the protection of their own homelands. We need our security personnel, the army, the police. We need them to be more in tune with these communities. You don't come to these communities and you are aloof. You don't come to these communities and you act like, look, we are people who have come from somewhere and you are just bloody civilians. I think that if, if you come to these communities and make people feel a sense of safety around you, feel like, look, you are for them, people would open up more. It will help policing. It will help maintain security in these places. But as it is right now, we're not really getting much of that. And I, I honestly, at the, with the trajectory, with what we have seen so far, I'm not seeing things getting better anytime soon. It's time to explore new options. I guess it's not a one-size-fits-all in terms of, you know, the, the solution. But uh, before um, we come to you, and this is Major General Ayola, because uh, I'd like you to respond to some of the things that Indicato had to say. We'd like to welcome Professor Ahmed Balogu, who's an expert, uh, climate change head laboratory for geoecology, sustainable food systems, uh, FUTA. That's the uh, Federal University of Technology, Akure. Professor, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, and uh, happy um, Democracy Day to Nigerians. Thank you very much. So, Major General Ayola, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you so very much. I, I recall that uh, when Southern Kaduna situation is similar to a lot part of the plateau. And uh, so when I was commanding Operation Safe Haven, what some, one method that we used to create an enabling environment on the farms was to get uh, our troops deployed around the farms, agree on the time for which farmers can go to their farms and the time they must depart. So we, we create the presence of the security forces. So while the farmer is working, the header is uh, handling his uh, you know, uh, cattle and uh, nobody does anything stupid at, around that time. So I think that period is known and it's announced to the community. They know that don't go to farm outside these hours. And that worked very well. Even though it's not the best of solution, but at least it's a workable solution. But what it also means is uh, for, for that tasking of the already overstretched armed forces and police and all of that. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a solution that worked. You know? So that, that's one thing I can add. Of course, obviously, if farmers are driven off their farms, if uh, people cannot go to farm because of fear of being killed, it's certainly the inevitable, <laughs> you know, unintended consequence of that will be scarcity of food. And that's what we are, we are getting. But I think we can try this method and uh, it will save the day for now. Professor Balogu, let's come to you. The Food and Agriculture Organization report suggests that insecurity, especially insurgency in the northeast states of uh, Borno, Adamawa, and Yobe, armed banditry in some northwest states, Sokoto, Katsina, Zamfara, and Kaduna, as well as the north central states of Benue and Niger, are key drivers for the food crisis. Uh, as someone who has studied this closely, how do you suggest we go about solving this? We know what has caused it, but how do we solve it? Well, um, the, our main problem is our lack of resilience and proactiveness. What we are seeing now is um, a case of uh, policy backfiring by our inability to empower the citizenry over a long period of time. And that has degenerated into uh, the crisis we are seeing. The bottom line now, as you have said, the issue is, uh, is not uh, about causes anymore. What do we do? We need to address the fundamental, which is that 
we have only been empowering institutions. We are not empowering the citizenry. If, like has been mentioned earlier, the people that are being protected or need protection or are part of the security architecture, the case will have been different. That's one. Secondly, the people in this region, majority of them lack social security and the same for the bulk of Nigerians. And if there is no social security, I mean, education, health, uh, everybody's poor, there's no way you can defend yourself against poverty. My take now is that going forward, we should change business as usual and focus more on empowering rural communities. As time permits, I will dwell more on how that will be achieved. And, but that, what that really means is that to end poverty, our rural communities must be empowered to protect themselves and to produce food and feed themselves. I'll leave it at that for now. <laughs> I mean, there is one thing, um, you know, the will, I mean, you know, we, we, one wants to, this is what should be done. But the second thing really is the will to do it. Um, how do we get that done for the people, uh, for students who have been on strike for many months, um, for those who need to be empowered, um, the rising skyrocketing costs of, of food? And it's not even uh, the Russia-Ukraine uh, war alone or, or the droughts, which we're seeing in the Horn of Africa. Um, do you think politics, we can't disabuse politics governance from what we're seeing when it comes to insecurity, Dr. Um, definitely not. Um, in fact, the politics or governance or the lack of it is a trigger and a driver of the insecurity. And so that brings me, I think, to the period that we're in. We're in a pre-election year, and the language out there is everybody should go get his voters cut. Um, in today's broadcast, the president emphasized his role in strengthening the electoral process. And he gave us a promise that everybody's vote is going to count. So I would, unlike I think Indy, I have hope. If the electoral process has been en enhanced, and I know it's been enhanced. There are measures that have been introduced within the electoral process to reduce rigging. So that means if you go out to vote, that person that you voted for is likely to, that vote is likely to count. So all I can say at this stage, given the relationship between governance and politics or lack of it and insecurity, is everybody should go get his voters cut and identify that person that promises you he or she is going to walk towards your aspirations. We all have different aspirations. Uh, I don't want to campaign for any individual <laughs> or political party. But as long as the person's promises, you can align with that, it resonates with you go and get your voter's card and go and vote. Um, the measures that have been introduced within the electoral process will make that vote count. So I've, I've got hope. Indy, are you convinced that, you know, um, come 2023, things will be looking up? I, I, I think we, I, I don't think we can get lower than this, hopefully. <laughs> I don't think we can get lower than this, but, um, one of one thing I've noticed now, and one thing I may, I have a major problem with is it seems governance has really stopped in favor of the preparation for 2023, and that's a serious problem. So hopefully after that things will look up. Um, INEC has done a lot. I think we've talked a lot about the electoral process, and yes, Mr. Cabrera, I actually have hope with respect to that. <laughs> These things are very specific. Um, INEC has done a lot to improve their process, and so when this election is a test, I mean, there's also the Oshun election, but this election is also a test to see how far these things have, um, you know, these these prepare has come. We are hoping that, look, this time around our votes count. Every election so far, I've seen some certain level of improvement. INEC has done a lot. They have done workshops. They have done a lot of co collaborations, even with civil society to show, look, they are ready for this. At the end of the day, we are going to see a le certain level of unpreparedness, you know, voting materials, all of that. But I think that we're going to have a much better election than the last one. Um, with respect to who is going to enter, it's very important that we take these elections very seriously, really, really important. 
um, elections has led us to where we are right now. And these things, the politics of things determine whether you sleep at night, how you eat, all of these things, all the policies, everything that affects us, these things determine them. And we need to take them seriously. So I'm not going to throw a damper or, you know, a damp or wet clothes on the elections because for a lot of us, this is the hope that we have that things are going to change. So this is where my hope is right now, that from 2023, at least we will see some improvement. We really can't go lower than where we are right now. I come to you, Professor Balogun, because uh, if people are hungry, they will not vote, uh, regardless of how many uh, summons INEC or indeed any of the other uh, agencies give. And uh, all the indications are that uh, if we don't do something quickly, uh, and so I'm going to drill down on the first question I asked you, uh, which you said if you had a bit more time, you would be able to address uh, a bit more uh, uh, in detail. It's important that we address that question in detail because even before now, um, Nigeria had some gaps uh, in its food sufficiency ratios. Uh, and so the insecurity coupled with what my colleague Millicent has just mentioned, the war in Ukraine, which means that we are largely uh, cut off from wheat, uh, oil, and a couple of other essentials, means that the situation is even worse uh, than, than it would otherwise have been. The key question at this point is that while all of us go get our PVCs uh, and prepare to vote for whoever we want to, we are hoping uh, that it will not be on an empty stomach because then we will not probably be making the choices we would otherwise have made. How do we do it in such a way that we avert what so many have called this looming crisis? It's, uh, forward, we need to separate politics from governance. It has been the norm in the past 30 years, and that's the problem. We have uh, 700 and but something local government in Nigeria. What is each of these local governments known for? And what are the states in which local governments exist doing to enhance the productivity of the people producing these items? This is the solution. We need to truly, holistically, honestly decide to identify our, what we call contemporary advantages, and close in on that and empower the people that are doing it. I'm not going to mention names. There are states where you have federal government silos. Those silos have been empty for God knows when. When in actual fact, what the governments of those states should have done is to task and empower the people to produce the grains that goes into those silos. And the list goes on. If we have youths that are not engaged, they are going to be tools for people that are going to use them forever, and that is what we are seeing. So my take on this is that if we look at the number of people in a particular local government, doing what? Do we have that data? I want to say that our political elites have apathy for knowledge. A lot have been said about intelligence gathering. It's all about data. It's all about knowledge. Do we have this information at the world, at the local government level? How many people are there? What are they engaged in? How and what are the plans to empower these people to do more. They are not doing that. Talk less of protecting themselves. They are not empowered to produce food to feed themselves. Now, they are also not empowered to protect themselves. So we need to go back to the basics. Apart from that, we have a system that, uh, how do you say, tie your hands. Our constitution needs to be seriously looked at to empower creativity and innovation. Right now, that is not happening because there are certain things you just cannot touch, even if you can. So these, these are the serious issues we need to address as a people. Thank you. 
Indeed. Uh, so, do, 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 Dr. Adamu, um, let me now come to you. I, I, I stayed with Professor Balogu because he, this is an area that he has studied, uh, particularly the food aspect. Uh, but now coming to the security uh, side of it, uh, which he also mentioned, which is that if the farmers can get to the farms, it doesn't matter what you do, what we're having is what we will have. And I asked Indy earlier on uh, to use the Southern Kaduna example to say, what really is the problem? We just, most of the time, the media just highlights the fact that X number of people were killed in an attack on Y number of villages. But what caused the problem usually is buried in paragraph 9 or 10, and most people don't read up to that point. Uh, what really have, have we discovered to be the problem, and how best can we tackle that in the shortest time possible so that we avert this crisis? Okay, the first part of your question, what really is the problem? Uh, a couple of things have been identified as the drivers of insecurity in Nigeria. Number one is grievances, unaddressed grievances. Some of them are political, social, or economic. Uh, the white disparity between the have and the have, have not. Um, a lot of persons are, are, are angry. Uh, because of these three points. Angry politically, angry socially, or economically. If I use the example of Benue State, uh, between the Domas and the Thieves, it's playing out right now. If you go to Kogi between the Ibras and the Galas, uh, go to Anambra State, go to Inugu State, recently one of the leading senators had to pull out of the electoral process because he, he was disenfranchised, and that's a senator. So that grievance is a huge driver. Num number two is climate change and the inability of the federal and state government to respond to the issues that climate change drive. As an example, desertification and how desertification is pushing populations further from the northern part into the southern part and how that is driving up some of the conflicts that we're seeing. Time will not allow me to go deeper in, into that. Number three is the porous borders that we have um, issues, conflict that is happening in the Sahel. And by the way, Sahel is now the new kind of war zone of the world. So a lot of conflicts are going on there. There are about four countries right now that have been taken over by military yes, units. Yes, in that and region. Exactly. And then the, the case is in Mali. Now that is also driving into Nigeria because of our porous but a lot of the weapons that are being used by these non-state actors are coming in from, from there. Uh, our judicial system that unfortunately is fails to arrest and punish offenders. People commit offenses and they're able to get away with it. Now, a typical example, kidnap for ransom. I'm a young man who decides to, you know, be law-abiding. Uh, I'm, I'm Fulani, and my, I inherited four cows from my dad. I raised those cows for 20 years, and they've turned into 20 cows. Multiply 20, say, by 500,000. How much would you get? But I go into kidnapping, commit one, one act of kidnapping, and I raise 100 million. Meanwhile, the other person is spending 20 years before he reaches that stage. At what point would I drop my profession and join the kidnapping profession? So um, our judicial uh, system that is failing to punish offenders is also a huge contributory element. And then the role of the influence elements within the society. Um, um, General Ayula mentioned one of them, which is the family. But there are others. The media is an influence. Influencers like Indy, you know, are also element. I know she has a huge followership on social media. Any statement um, share. Uh, Shea Uthani, the former senator, a statement he makes can move a lot of youth to a certain direction. And then, of course, our schools. And that is the one that worries me, that keeps me up at night. Currently, the universities are, sh are shut down. Um, our, our primary schools, the role of the teachers, when, for instance, they allow um, certain values that we used to uphold as a society, or they are no longer tenable within those schools. So that, all of that plays, th those are the key drivers. In the case of Southern Kaduna, um, all of these elements are at play. Uh, I didn't mention the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. It's also a huge driver, because no matter how angry you are, if you don't have a gun, for instance, to go and commit the act, uh, it's likely that whatever you do will be limited. But the moment you have a gun, then it's... So all of these things play together as the drivers of insecurity. And to your, the second part of your question, how do we end all of this? We've got a beautiful document, the Revised National Security Strategy 2019. That document trans, um, uh, moved us from our conce concept of national security, which was state-centric, to a concept of security that was human, including food security. So all the elements to enhance food security are contained in that document. Um, 
In summary, what I think we should do, let's go back to that document. It was introduced in 2019. Have we done a review to see the implementation? What are the challenges towards the implementation of that document? I don't think we've, we've, we've done that. So we've got the answer. We just need to enhance our implementation. And, and to that extent, I would encourage, especially the role of the legislature. They have a responsibility. There are three core functions are legislation, um, oversight, and then, of course, representation. So in, both, in the, these three functions, they can actually look at this document and find out why is it that this is a beautiful document, why are we not implementing it? If we say, for instance, that our national aspiration is to ensure food security, but we are at a situation where in one community, the ability of that community to produce has been limited by about 80%, we should find out why that ability reduced by about 80%. Thank you, Dr. Cabero. Um, our audience, they're eaching to ask questions. And yes, we're and very I, certain. I actually have uh, uh, quite a number of them here. Uh, we'll, uh, uh, General Ayola and Indy, uh, we'll, we'll come to you in a couple of minutes uh, for your closing comments on this segment. But at this point, I want to call on some members of our audience to ask uh, uh, yes. some questions yes. of. Yes, but we'll come, back to, we'll come back to them. We just need to go on a quick break. Do stay on with us. It is not always every time that the, the changeover of government from military to civilian goes as clockwork as that of a bus on the way to the It could be difficult in some instances, but maturity is required to deal with it, experience is required, and patriotism is required on both sides. That will not be lacking by the grace of God on this occasion too, certainly not on this side. Welcome back. It's in our special program here on Democracy Day with the theme, Giving Hope to Nigerians. And we're soon going to, of course, um, get some other questions from our audience. But Dr. Kabir, I just quickly wanted to ask you about cybersecurity. That's an issue. Um, but how badly is it affecting us? Um, a lot. Uh, we are in a modern world where technology, um, Internet of Things as an example, um, social media uh, apps and platforms have been created that we have no control over and we are not ready for them. Now on the one hand, there are platforms for gathering intelligence and in my honest opinion, even the government of departments have not realized that those are platforms for gathering intelligence. In the president's speech um, this morning, he did mention cyber security and um, surveillance. So I think that um, you know, as we go forward, especially as we move into the 2023 election, we need to start talking about the role of cyber security and the role of um, surveillance capabilities within the cyberspace towards enhancing our security. And to do that, uh, there are certain major things that we need to avoid. Um, in post NSAS, we saw what CBN did. It closed the accounts of certain persons. And then if you look at the, the digital currency, those that got involved, their accounts were affected. And that's not good for a democracy. Um, we need to ensure that we're proactive and put in place laws that are not only transparent, but that also inform the citizens that if you do X, this is what is going to happen. If you wait and you're proactive like the Twitter ban, then the kind of negative image that we got around the world would happen. So cyber security is here. It's necessary, but we also need to be proactive. And speaking about the revised national security, Strategy 2019. It also spoke about cyber security. So hopefully, if we, my recommendation, if we do a review on the implementation of that strategy, perhaps we can also look at cyber security. Sometimes one wonders if the government is just really far from the people, or there needs to be an agency between the government and the people. So accountability, militant. Um, the government needs to be more accountable. 
um, if you ask me for one word that would improve our lot at the moment, frankly, I would mention accountability. The government should be accountable, especially if agent. All right, let's, uh, let's hear from our audience. Uh, Ruth Kezo, you have 30 seconds to ask your question. Where, where is she? My question is this. Um, the general blamed the, par the, the issues of the youth on the parenting. And one of the things I know that there is fear and there is hunger in the land. And there's this blaming going on, you know. How do the government help to, you know, take care of this, the economy because there's hunger? There's this economic issue that we need to s sort out rather than blaming ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, General Ayala, please take note. That question is for you. Um, I will let see Oluwa Mayowa. 30 seconds. Happy democracy to everyone. Uh, my question is, um, why is it that the military do not communicate their successes to the uh, citizen? Uh, and is there any um, security reasons to that? I won't take note of that. That's your question. Aziz Akeushola. Happy Democracy Day to everyone. Um, my question is to what extent will sensitization go in increasing the rising crime rate among youths in Nigeria? Thank you. Indicator, that's for you. Uh, we'll take one more. Clara Akpan. Happy Democracy Day, Nigerians. My question goes to Dr. Adamo. You said uh, you are into commercial security, and you get uh, security information sometimes early enough. But because you are in the commercial security, it doesn't get to the rest of the public, you know, Nigerians. How can Nigerians benefit from what you do? And what advice or what idea can you contribute to the security agencies on how they can improve their strategy to get the security intelligence information early enough and how they can act on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Patrick Esekodi. Happy democracy to all Nigerians. My question is to um, Dr. Kabiru. Um, there's a lot of money being said that, you know, in the budget. Um, but we find out that at the end of the day, there's little or nothing when it comes to intelligence. We don't have the right intelligence to at least get information and gather what is going on around. Now, my question is this, because in the developed countries, you will find out that a, a lot of intelligence is done. But I want to know, how can we move forward? You know, that's my question. Thank you. And uh, finally, I have uh, here, I believe the name here is Dosumu. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, happy Democracy Day, Nigeria. Um, my question goes to us. Apart from the intelligence um, department, as you have mentioned earlier, um, it's crystal clear that we're in, uh, in a digital world, and it's, it's very, very shown that we have not been leveraging it. So my question goes to us, what about leveraging technology as a tool to curb the insecurity? Because I'm very, very aware of programs, applications that can be made together in order to solve all these conundrums. But however, I don't know, maybe the police force or the military arms are making use of it. Thank you. Now, uh, it seems as if quite a number of people want Dr. Adamo to. Uh, <laughs> so we'll come back to you, Dr. Adamo. Let me start with you, uh, uh, General Ayola. Um, the question about the issue with the youth and the gap, the issue of parenting. Uh, there's a question around that. What's your response? Thank you very much. I want to thank uh, uh, the person that raised that question. It's a, it's a very critical one. Yeah, it, it's very simple. We all came into the world dependent on our parents. So the start point for bringing of anyone at all is the home. Now, every part of society has its own share in raising a child. It starts from the home, then the child goes to school, then the, the teachers and the, the school community begin to contribute their own portion. And then, of course, it goes to the larger society as the child grows up to become an adult. 
So, so I'm only starting by saying, okay, that start point is very critical because that's where the foundation is laid. Foundation for values, ethics, character, it starts from the home. We, we can't run away from that. That's not to say that I'm putting the whole blame on, on parenting. No, I'm just taking that fundamental, that foundational aspect of it. You know, because usually, I mean, you talk about catching them young. What, what anybody, whatever anybody gets at the home front, it becomes the reference point from judging when it begins to go out, peer pressure and other societal influences are usually resolved with reference to that home training. You know, and that's very strong. That, that's just the point I made. That, permit me to just say a word. That was a question. I know you're giving Dr. Adamu, but I think it's more of a military question. Why the military does not advertise its successes? Uh, basically and professionally, an average military officer is not given to advertising successes. That's typically, I mean, based on you know, inclinations and all of that. But secondly, there's also what we call operation security, OPSEC. Sometimes in advertising a success, you may be giving out some information that will subvert your further and future you know, operations. So usually you have, to, you have to be able to balance it and see if, uh, if there's any necessity to do so. And if it does not jeopardize your future successes. You know, that, that's just what I want to say about that. Thank Very you much. Yeah, that, that, that takes that burden off uh, uh, Dr. Adamu. Uh, in the, your question, uh, which I asked you to note, your response, please. So first of all, um, with respect to rising um, crime and youths, there's poverty in the land. There's a sense of hopelessness. Young people are idle. They are out of school. They do not have jobs. Definitely these things are going to lead to rising cases of, um, of criminality. The other part of it is we do need behavioral change in Nigeria. So yes, there is a need. There's a need for concerted effort towards behavioral change. Nigerians are beginning to, not beginning, it's there right there in our culture, in our music, on Instagram, on social media, everything points to an ostentatious culture, a culture that is pushing for, look, look at wealth, look at all the trappings of wealth without any explanation for where this wealth is coming from. I do think that the government, national orientation agencies, civil society organizations, all of us need to do a concerted push towards behavioral change for Nigerians because at the rate we are going, sometimes it's not even the fact that, oh, there is hunger in the land. At some point, people are looking, just like Dr. Dr. Kabir said, somebody with his 20 cows knows how long it's going to take for his 20 cows to bring money. And another person goes and kidnaps and gets 100 million. People start to think that that is the place, that is the way to go. So we need to start pushing back to honest work in Nigeria. We're seen in a lot of spaces, a lot of spaces, the praise, even in our churches, our mosques, everywhere, the praise for unexplained wealth. People are keen into this because, of course, again, the judicial system, there's no sense of justice. Just however you get it, that's what we're seeing now. We are rewarding a system where however you get it, once you have it, you are rewarded. We need to take a step back from that. So I do support his, his notion. And yes, there needs to be a concerted effort. National Orientation Agency you are there for that. Civil society organizations, you are there for that. And a lot of us who have some level of influence, this is the time to start talking about these things and pushing from the pulpit, from the mosques for these kinds of things, because at the rate we are going, our, our entire culture is subsumed with this. It's not, it's not looking pretty. I've spoken about this over and over again. The key is behavioral change. Indeed. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Balogu, before I come to Dr. Adamu, who will have the last word on this, uh, uh, on this and in this segment, uh, let me come to you, Professor Balogu, and ask a question that I, I was surprised that nobody asked within this audience because it had to do with food. Uh, and that is that most people think that agriculture is something that other people do and that they just go and collect food and eat. Um, so very few people are involved in agriculture. But what can we do to make it possible for more people to find agriculture interesting? Thank you very much. Um, the climate change global issue has also come with it some positives. And given the changing climate, we are now talking about growing more food with less land and less input, what we call climate smart agriculture. And it's something that everybody can engage in. 
we've talked about a lot, and I was uh, uh, fascinated about the issue of the guy that inherited for cows and the one that is kidnapping. Now, back to what I was saying, that guy that has four cows, now 20 cows, selling for one, one for between 250 and 500, what support has he gotten? Now, with climate smart agriculture, he does not have to move his cow from Kano, Katina, Jigawa, wherever, to any place. There are now creative innovations that allows him to grow the food that the cows will eat year round. The same thing that is part of growing more food with less land and less inputs. If you have irrigation, you have a few, there's, a, there's a maximum amount of food that one cow requires. You know the number of cows you have. You know the amount of land you have. You can grow their food on a particular land, and you can harvest and feed them with it without moving them from one place to another. Yes, that's, that's one way to go. With regards to people, when I said all of us can do it, all of us can engage in sustainable agriculture. You don't have to physically be on the field. It opens up a totally new investment. The rural areas with underutilized lands and young people that are drifting to the cities, why don't we go into those places, like I was saying, our lands are fragmented, no problem. Aggregate those lands, provide the input, machinery, and resources to those communities. Engage young people and pay them well. A ton of maize as we speak is between 220 and 270,000, depending on whether it's white maize. And it takes between uh, 75 days and 90 days, which means that with climate smart agricultural innovations, we can actually produce this three times or a year on the same land. Professor Malogo, we are, we are winding down on the program. We appreciate your time, but you know, you have the final word. Several questions. And you have three or four questions. <laughs> yes. That I will, will plead that you answer them in uh, at most two and a half minutes. Let me summarize. Monies and budgets. We have so much monies and then yet no intelligence. Um, how do we move forward? Technology as a tool to curbing insecurity. And uh, how can Nigeria benefit from what you do? Awesome. L let me start with the first question that was answered by General I I Ayala. Yeah. Um, uh, terrorism is about influence, and the best way military can win the hearts and minds of the people is to communicate their successes. So while I agree with General Ayula that there is a need to be circumspect in sharing information, I think in the democratic space it's absolutely necessary that the machinery of government, not just the military, speaks about success so that people can key in and understand the rule. That if, if I don't feel you're protecting me, frankly, I'm not going to support you. But if I feel you're protecting me, I will. Now, the, all the other three questions, I can tie them, I can answer them as one. With regards to the lady who asked about um, what I do and whether I communicate it to government, the amazing thing is my products are free. They are not paid for. Uh, if you go to my website, Beacon Consulting, you can see we've got um, a, a, an incident tracker. You can, your local government, I think you come from the south, south, you can pinpoint your local government and see our trend, our analysis. Likewise, we produce reports and we, we share it. And the amazing thing is they do use it, but they don't give me the credit. So I'm hoping that by this medium, uh, they start giving me, the, or at least giving my organization the, the, the credit. Um, I decided not to, the Japa technology, or rather philosophy, I decided not to join it. I'm here in Nigeria with my family, so frankly, my take is here in Nigeria. Um, the second question regarding technology. Technology is a force multiplier in security. If we use it, it will help us. If we decide to go as we're going right now, and like um, the professor said, we're afraid to you know, embrace the data, then we'll continue where we are. Uh, big data, uh, companies like um, Tesla, like Twitter, name them. They embrace big data, and we, we see where they are. Meta is the way the world is going at the moment. So frankly, uh, we need to also embrace technology into security. And then, of course, the last question, um, budget and intelligence. Um, what I created in my organization, I know how much I spent. I have seen the budgetary allocations for the different security departments, and I thought to be corrected without sounding 
bogus about my, my statement. Uh, what I am spending is about one tenth out of what these organizations are spending. And without blowing my trumpet, my products are much better than their products. So probity and accountability needs to be extended into the budgetary uh, system as well. All that, that money I've seen, frankly, is a little bit too much for what the kind of products I've seen being produced by the organizations. So I'm hoping that especially the National Assembly and uh, organizations like the EFCC and ICPC would start looking into that direction. We'd like to thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Kabir Adamu, for joining us here. And uh, from thank Abuja Studios in Decato, thank you so much. And Major General Henry Ayola, always a pleasure. Thank you. And of course, virtually, Professor uh, Ahmed Balogun, thank you so much for joining us on our June 12 special. You've been watching the channel's television June 12 special. Ah, give it hope to Nigerians. I'm Ladia Kiridulali. And I'm Innocent Walker. You can, of course, watch this episode of the program and others on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much for watching. Happy Democracy Day. Bye bye.